Hello, everybody. Um, my name is John Yoon. I'm from Penn Medicine. I'd like to thank uh, Seattle Science Foundation for inviting me and allowing me to talk about uh, single position laterals. I've um, been a big fan of the Seattle Science Foundation. I love your content and really honored to be um, here today and then amongst the uh, really esteemed faculty. So um, I'll get started. You know, the lateral, single position lateral surgery, you know, I, I um, got exposed to lateral surgery during residency and fellowship. But one of the things that I found a little bit frustrating about the lateral is that you have to position the patient and then flip them for the screws. So the workflow-wise, uh, I found that it takes longer than oftentimes uh, the T-lifts or minimally invasive T-lifts, uh, although the, the outcomes and then the diffusions are, uh, and the deformity corrections um, in the long term, I, I thought that the lateral offers a lot of advantages, but there's a lot of uh, the workflow uh, issues with laterals being two-position surgery. So I began to really try to explore you know, what are the options to do this operation efficiently and then really cut down on a lot of the sort of human factors that we talked about in earlier talks. So the, one of the, uh, the, the things that I, that I found that I kind of mixed and match, I was exposed to different robotic platforms, um, Globus, Mazor, is that those robotic systems are, um, have a large base um, and it's got a pretty bulky uh, um, um, platform. So what that does in a lateral surgery is that I, I often like to um, use navigation for guidance, but I also like the fluoroscopy to sort of confirm my levels, confirm my trajectories, and really confirm where I am before I put the occasion. So all those robotic platform, which have a pretty large base, gets in my way of getting the uh, C-arm in, doing the screws, and then bringing it out. I didn't really like those of um, uh, the workflow limitation. So I came across CERC, uh, which is a uh, sort of a passive robotic platform, very light, it's about 25 pounds. It's, it can be mounted on the surgical table instead of having its own base. Um, and this really allowed sort of a seamless um, robotic guidance uh, while I achieved, the, uh, the, um, achieved my lateral orthodesis. So um, the important things to, to set up is that since this is, once it's uh, um, mounted on the table, you could move it intraoperatively, but it's, it's a hassle. So uh, once you've set this up, uh, if you want to set yourself for success, you want to make sure after, before you drape, uh, you want to have the robotic arm set up far away from where you're operating, but not too far so that you cannot get to the screws. Um, so I always do a little, little check to make sure I get the ideal trajectory based on the navigation, even before I start the incision and prepping. Now, um, that's, that's for the robotic arm. Um, another advantage of combining the robotic system uh, with the lateral fusion is that I get the navigation information, which can be used uh, during the uh, lateral portion to tailor my incision, uh, and then also doing a anterior to psoas approach for the lateral interbody, I can use the navigation information to really get ideal trajectory. So it really cuts down on the, um, the floor time, amount of exposures you get to the staff and the patient. And also, um, I'm gonna briefly talk about this concept of simultaneous anterior posterior approach. So it frees me up to do, um, if you have an assistant surgeon, you can actually do two incision, two approach at the same time. So I'll kind of get started. So the, right now the patient is uh, left side down. Uh, you want the patient uh, sort of close to the table, uh, edge of the table, so that you can put the screws in on the downside. And, and this is uh, very critical. If you have the patient sort of in the middle of the table, uh, you may not get that trajectory to, to put the screw in. So very critical to get the patient as close to the edge of the table. Um, and then you want to secure them really, really well because you don't want any shifts. It's uh, the same principles of the lateral uh, approach uh, applies here. So I, I've marked out the incision. So I first start out after everything's draped. Oh, so the reference frame, I, I prefer it to be in the PSIS. Uh, and and, and this, this, this is out of the way and it's usually flipped uh, towards the buttock. And I usually have my camera at the, at the, uh, the foot of the bed so I, I don't have any obstruction between the camera and then to the reference frame and to my screws. So um, 
after I set this up, I make sure I prep really wide down here. You want to get exposure of the, the, the lumbar, the dorsal area, as well as the anterior part of the body. So you have both working angle for the lateral as well as the, the, uh, for the pedicle screws in the back. So um, same thing, with the, this is a very, um, uh, the planning wise is a very uh, uh, seamless, just like the, any navigated uh, perk screws. I plan out all the incisions for, for the um, uh, perk screws. And, um, and today we'll be doing L2 to 4, lateral interbody and perk screws. So once I uh, position, mark out my incision, um, I like to start with the screw that are the toughest, because if something were to happen, at least have those done. So um, I, start, I start with the downward screws where trajectory for the screw angle is going to be very, very tough. So I've already made the incision. So make, I make an incision uh, paramedian, and I make an incision just big enough so that I can actually stick my finger and feel the, the transverse process. And so this is a, uh, even though this is a uh, navigated robotic assistance, the tactile feedback and ability to sort of feel all this landmark is very important. So I've already did some dissection with my finger, and then I go in with this uh, navigated probe. And, uh, and for this screw, I, um, I actually pre-planned the screws so that it actually has, I, I just have to land right up there. So, I find my starting point, okay. So now I'm, I'm feeling with my uh, pointer that I can feel the TPs, um, and then now I'm feeling the uh, medial part of the facet joint, and then feel the mammillary process, and then, okay, I like that trajectory. Now, once I have that, um, the finger dissection has already created a track, so, for this, the, this robotic arm is a passive. So unlike a lot of the, the platforms out there where it's an active um, arm, you just press a button and then it gets you to that point. The Cirque is a passive robot. The advantage is that it's actually quite fast once you get used to this. Um, so that you can uh, this just really act as a uh, stiff troll car. Um, and, and then at the end of this troll car is a really sharp um, um, really sharp like trocar that's really docks into the bone, um, which actually helps with the securing your position so there's no skiving. So right here, I like that trajectory. The circ has a three joints that each of them, you, if you click it, it unlocks all the joints below it. So I like to have that in here, confirm that this looks good. Now I'm feeling the bone. The trocar is docked on the bone itself. So it's not floating in the air, okay? And if that, I like that trajectory, I take this choker out. And then this is the um, depth, uh, the gauge for, the, um, uh, for your drill. So um, I usually set it to about 30 or 35. And what that does is it allows the, uh, the drilling into the pedicle. And, um, and this is unnavigated. So, here, you know, if you imagine doing this without the robot, it's very uncomfortable. I mean, even though, even if you have the information from NAV to put the screws in, keeping that angle, especially if you're operating on someone with osteoporosis, um, some difficult anatomy, this is a kind of difficult trajectory to get. So what it does is that really a robotic arm allows me to get this really tough angle in a lateral decubitus position. So once I have that docked, um, I slide this K-wire in, and then you can actually get a good tactile feedback, okay, seeing the bone. Now, usually I have an assistant, Seth, do you mind coming here and then holding the K-wire? Let's do the, oops, I like the blunt end. Yeah, I usually use a blunt K-wire so that um, it doesn't accidentally poke through. And then now, the important thing is that we want to keep this K-wire while we take this robotic arm. So actually, be careful. This is sharp end. I use a blunt end. Okay. So this thing um, is the uh, trocar. So I'm going to remove this, keep the K-wire in the same place, and then move the robotic arm out of the way. Now, you just have to put the screw under the navigation. Do you mind uh, doing that? Yep. 
Now, so this is the Viper Prime um, the screw. This will slide over the K wire. And then now I can feel the bone. And this just becomes just like the navigated pedicle screw. So it will slide over the K wire. Can you guys, can you guys fix the, um, so right now there's a um, projection of the, the screw, but that's actually not where the screw is. You can get rid of the yellow, um, the orange thing. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. So the actual screw is the, the green, okay? Okay. Okay. So it feels like a bone, right? Remove that. Okay, so done with one screw. So I would continue uh, putting the screws in. And um, Seth, do you mind helping me with the screw? So again, I'll start from the beginning. I'll make a skin incision, sort of in, the, in line with where you think the trajectory of the screw could be. And then I do a finger dissection here. Now I can feel where the TP is. Okay. Now the, um, the Brain Lab software does have this um, warning if there's a skiving issue. So we may have bumped the, the, the patient here. Okay, let's put the joke uh, out, okay. So oftentimes what I would do is, um, if I'm working with a pretty experienced resident, um, I'll have them um, actually do the screw part. Um, so that looks pretty good. And after I secure and everything looks good, I again bring this in. So this just works just like the navigation. So it's not too much of the um, too much of a workflow difference between doing this uh, using a robot versus a just using a navigation. So so here I'm feeling all the landmark. I can feel the TPs laterally. Okay. Let's start out there. There you go. Okay, let's lock that. Okay. So, John, can I ask yeah. you a couple questions while you're working? Yeah, of course. Cool stuff. Um, so, this part of it is not a robotic guiding success here, but you are actually uh, going and matching up the trajectory that you're in there. So, it's a yes. manual use of the robot. Exactly. Got it. Got it. Okay. It's, it's just, more of a... Can, can you repeat his question? We can't hear him in here. Oh, yeah. So, so this is not a fully automated robot. Got it. Where it's, uh, you, it, robot is sort of working off of your plan. It's more a functioning like a cobot. Uh, so you, you physically have to align it yourself. No, I was just wanting to... I just wanted everybody to understand that because I'm learning here, watching you. It's fascinating. This, yeah. is, this, this is a cool meeting. This is incredible. So, you know, again, I drop the screws. I mean, I, I, I drill a pilot hole. So, so the advantage, I think, that the passive robot have over the active robot. I mean, active robot does allow you to just plan and trust that the robot gets you to where you need it. A passive robot actually force you to be use your tactile senses. Like I, I do a lot of finger dissection. I make sure that what I'm feeling is making sense with the robot. So I'm not blindly trusting it. So that, you can hold that there. This is great. I have to learn a whole new vocabulary like <laughs> cobots. Okay, that's cool. Cobot. And you're actually doing the operation rather than having the whole leap of faith of trusting this thing. Yes. And you get to go down there and you talk about feeling the anatomy, which is, that's really great. I, I think that your understanding of, of knowing where the mammillary process is and the transverse process and right. all those things. Right. That's a wonderful thing because you're actually feeling and understanding where you're going and what you're doing. Yes. Beautiful. And, and, and uh, you know, I always tell the residents that you have to learn how to put the screws in open and then do it to perk before you can really take advantage of the robot system. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I'm getting a great tactile feedback here. It feels like a bone. So that's the concept. Um, so actually, Seth, um, Seth is uh, my rep 
And I don't think you've put in any screws yet, right? So I'm gonna have him put the screws in. So he, this is what I typically do. I have, I just did this to show the everybody this is how you put the screws. After I work with the residents a couple times and they get pretty facile with the system, um, I leave them to do the perk screws with robots and it frees me up to do anterior approach at the same time. Um, and I can see exactly, so the one advantage of navigation robot in general is that I know exactly where they're going. Um, and I, if, I, if I see something on the screen, if I see them that the robot is not docked correctly, I can, I can just correct them. So Seth, why don't you actually come here and to put the screws in. John, can you also show us about the skive meter on, on the circ, where that is and yes. what that looks like? Yeah, so actually, let me put that in. So the one um, nice feature on this thing is that if you're putting too much force, so this is the, um, the navigation screen. Let's say if I'm putting in too much force here and causing an inaccuracy, the system has a sort of, sort of a sail phase, uh, this, the fail-safe system where it'll tell you you're, you're uh, putting too much force. So let's see. Can you, is that on right now? I'm purposely putting a lot of force here. Oh, you don't have it in active mode. So um, yeah, so, um, so just to tell you, like right now, I'm, I'm actually probably broken into the pedicle here. Uh, but normally, they'll have a, a warning sign on the screen. If I'm putting too much force um, on this robotic system where I'm leaning against this, um, and you will have that warning on the screen that you're putting too much force, there's a skiving that's happening. So it's, it's, a, it's a software warning, um, and then this has like a sensor that can detect how much force you're putting on. So we don't see it right now, but normally it would come up yeah. in yellow or something like that. Yeah, it will say, it will say on here um, that there is a too much force being applied. Thanks. So, Seth, why don't you put the screw in here? You may have to adjust it a little bit, okay? So, so while, while my resident, uh, my assistant is doing that pedicle screw placement, what I'm doing now is um, I've already kind of marked out the incision. Uh, for the sake of time. Can I see the pointer real quick too? Yeah, let's get that trajectory there. Yeah. So Mike is trying to put the screws in into the trajectory. Okay, good, all right. Let's actually cover that. Um, so I just want to show the audience. So one advantage of having using this system is that it allows you to really tailor your incision and approach for the lateral. So I can use the same same navigation information here. So we're doing a two, three, and um, three, four lateral inner body, and this is the one on the left is the axial view. That's the coronal view. So this is sort of like uh, AP and then um, the lateral view on the fluoroscopy. Now I can use this information. So we're gonna do an anterior to psoas approach where I'm going to peel off the psoas muscle. So, so my approach is gonna be more like this, obliquely, okay? So now after I actually get there, I'm gonna have to compensate and come perpendicular to the disc space. And what the navigation allows me to do is, is get roughly the idea what's my perpendicular to the disc space angle is. So here, I already marked it out, so this is a three, four, that's a two, three. This is a three, four um, disc, okay? If I go down that trajectory, it's roughly exactly where the, uh, the angle of my implant should be. So I get that information, if I was using a fluoro, end up putting a lot of shots, adjusting my hands, but the navigation allows me to really um, tailor my approach from the beginning. So helps out in both the screws and the lateral approach. So um, if you guys are working towards uh, putting the screws in, um, this is the time I come in. Um, so the ATP approach, I mark out the anterior border, posterior border of the body, I mark out the middle of the disc, and then my incision usually ends up being center, uh, right at the anterior border of the vertebral body. 
in about a three-inch incision. And typical approach, um, you, you bluntly uh, dissect through the external obliques, which runs uh, in the body kind of like this. You're putting a pocket in your hands, and that's the external. Internal is going to be perpendicular to that fiber. And then the last layer is going to be transverse abdominis, which runs um, and lateral medial. Um, so after we do that, oh, so at this level, at 2-3, um, the floating rib, so the 12 rib was on the way. So um, typically, I like to um, dissect, protect all the uh, neurovascular structure below, and then I resect the ribs. Now, after I get down, um, this is my preferred tool. This is actually um, OBP uh, surgical makes these. These are actually used for breast surgery. Uh, but it's a lighted handle retractor. Um, I, I, um, I'm all about human factors and ergonomics. I did not like using uh, headlights because I need to be in the posterior and anterior at the same time. So with the headlight on, my nurses had to chase my tail to really um, you know, move it up and down. So um, this is a great um, sort of a surgical tool that gives you the lighting illumination. So while uh, my assistant is putting the, uh, the screws in, completing the screws, I already have everything dissected. Um, I'm seeing the psoas muscle. We're doing an ATP approach where I've already dissected off the, the psoas muscles of the vertebral body. Now, um, can I see the pointer, please? So I'm already at the, um, the three, four, and four, uh, two, three. So I just want to show you right there. So this is a three, four. So I, I confirmed it visually that this is a three, four, this space right here. And then I want to see where is my midpoint of the, the disc. So I actually put this pointer inside of this space. Voila, I'm here. Right, and then my angle is like this. So if I go straight down, that's pretty good trajectory right here. Now, once I have that, let's have the uh, yeah, let's have the uh, the K wires and dilators. So you can attach a different arrays to different instruments. So this one, um, you know, some really big people, this array for um, uh, the the pointer may not be enough. So you can attach the initial dilator. They have a little attachment that you can calibrate the, the length of this instrument so you know exactly where it is. So it's exactly the same. Okay, so let's, let's I'm gonna take this out and put this in. And if I like that, trajectory, and then the location. Oh, it's going the other way. Okay, that looks pretty good. So now let's have the K wire. So this allows me to do the surgery where I used to do a lot of fluoroscopy. Do you have a mallet? Um, you know, I used to use tons and tons of fluoroscopy and really cuts down on, uh, on the amount of radiation. Oh, thank you. So it really cuts down the amount of radiation that I use. So once I have this docked, okay, that looks pretty good. Do you have the, do you have the uh, one that's not attached? No, just one, okay. So you get the concept. Usually I have two of them. I have one that's navigated, the other one that's not navigated. So once I get that, I take this out and switch. Uh, but actually, let's save this. Let's just go to the, um, Let's go to that, that one so it doesn't. So this is the, um, the TDAN retractor system from DPU Synthes. And then, you know, at this point, um, I would stimulate. Um, so they have a directional stimulation. And let's, um, do you mind uh, Seth helping me with this? Yeah, yeah. So that looks good. So once we have this attached, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, Check, check my um, location again before I do start the discectomy. Yeah, so actually it's gonna come out like that, exactly. Yeah. So this is a uh, three-bladed uh, retractor system. 
Um, if that thing you have to loosen that up a little bit more. Yeah. There we go. So now um, let's do that a little bit tighter. So now um, if I'm doing this, the screw placement is almost almost done. Okay. So now let's let's just start the discectomy here. So now I know K wire is exactly the location in the middle of the disk space. So I'm going to confirm again on navigation that do you have a lighting system here, Seth? So this is this is where my K wire is. It's, it's roughly at the anterior third, maybe a, a half. Um, but I know that if I go straight down, I'm gonna be fine. Okay. So at this point, do you have the uh, scalpel? Do we have it uh, running out of time? Okay. All right. So I mean, this will be then a pretty standard. Um, uh, discectomy. Now, the couple things that are going to be a little bit different is that they have a, I use a um, navigated cob. They have ability to attach the, uh, the, the navigation to the cob instrument so that I know exactly where the, uh, you know, where I'm passing the cob. Um, and then before, you know, I always, I always check though, before I put the final implant, I would bring a C-arm to just to check um, if my cage placement is adequate. But I find that with brain lab navigation with combination with robotics, it really allows me to, um, you know, really cut down a lot of the uh, workflow issues that happens with, uh, with just doing it with the flora. So I think uh, it, for the interest of time, I think that's, that's it. All right.